You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today I have a really special guest. Uh, I guess lightning does strike twice. I think the old thing was if you got attacked by a shark, go win a lottery ticket. I think this guy punched a lottery ticket because he just won two BFLs this year. Chris Bromet, he goes, he can catch him on Smith, but he's like, you know what? I want to diversify my portfolio. I'm going to catch him on a tidal <laughs> fishery. James River champion. How are you doing this morning, boss? I'm doing great. You know, uh, big win this week and i was pretty excited it's exactly what you said you know just i guess everybody kind of expects you to do well at smith to uh to do well on the james river is a uh a, something that's not expected but uh i certainly uh am thrilled to have done well there how going into this you won smith mountain lake it it i think it puts the jitters off for the season that you ha- you crack a nice win going into the james river did you have any con- like preconceived notions of how you were going to practice and prepare yourself for the event? So I had just fished it the week before, so I knew the tide was completely opposite. So my game plan was really to start where I stopped because I finished fourth the week before. I had almost 16 pounds and really had a nice bag and the bites were getting, uh, if I could have, I was the early draw, early boat. So I had to be in at two o'clock. Some guys got, didn't have to be in until close to four. So I could, it, I felt like if I could have stayed in that spot longer, I really, I, I had the fish there to, to do really well the week prior, which a fourth place finish is nothing to sneeze at uh, out of 150 boats. But I, I feel like I had enough to at least finish second place in that tournament right right there in that spot. How important is that tide in that boat draw? You know, I, I, I'm not a tide guy. So for me, I really didn't realize how important the tide was. Um, I, I found that spot and I guess the tide was perfect when I found it. But, you know, it, it, it it's it's huge. I mean, the tide is, is just huge. Once when, when that feeding window opens up, you can catch them super quick. And I mean, almost every cast. And when that when the window is gone, you may catch one an hour, you know, and, and the same fish are there. They just don't want to bite. When you think of the James River, um, and I think we mentioned this on the show last time on Smith, it, it's Smith Mountain Lake. A lot of times you're going to be burning spots. You're moving around the Potomac River. A lot of times is the antithesis of that. You might just camp on a grass bed. Before you found this spot, were you thinking it would be a lot of camping or running and gunning? Uh, I anticipated kind of like going the absolute furthest I had planned on going and then basically running a bunch of spots all the way back to the ramp. Smart. Uh, I, so running quite a bit, but I have spots in the James just as well as I have spots in the Chick that, that I found through the years. And I had planned on kind of trying to hit all of them until I had had gotten a bag that I felt like was good enough to, you know, really I was looking for that. Honestly, I was going to be happy with 13 and a half pounds. It is the, I don't know how much um, experience and time you've had on the Potomac. It, is the James more of a running gun place versus like the Potomac river, which notoriously you camp in a grass bed and you can catch 18 pounds. I, yeah, I would say people definitely change spots a lot more in the James. Um, for me personally, at the Potomac, I move spots quite a bit as well. I'm not a grass bed fisherman. You know, I, I, I got several good friends who love to fish the Potomac, actually locals to the Potomac. And those guys seem to be OK with sitting in a grass bed all day and coming to the weigh in like ah, they just didn't bite today. You know, I got two fish for, you know, good weight, but it's only two fish. But I sat where I knew there were fish all day long. They just didn't bite. I've, I've never been OK with that. I, I like to. um at least make sure I catch a limit every tournament. So I'm, I'm moving until I catch that limit. I'm not, I'm not really too concerned with sitting in a grass bed all day. I, I don't really even understand that type of fishing. Uh, I lose confidence in a spot. If, if I've been there for 20 minutes and I don't have a fish, I have no confidence. So I got to move. So it sounds like you were targeting specifically, you preferred on the James to target hard cover areas, docks, uh, lay downs, things of that ilk. So that, that's what it would seem like. But actually what I had found, and a lot of people, you know, they think they know where I was at. Um, but I actually had found one one small creek. And I say small, it was a decent sized creek. But I had found one creek and there was 
a bunch of pads and then off of the pads some grass and I, I guess it was hydrilla. I don't even know what kind of grass grows up there to be quite honest with you but on the edge of that grass I don't know if it was stuff that locals had planted or if it was I, I have no idea what it was because most of it was standing up but it wasn't high off the ground I mean I was fishing two to six foot of water but I found those spots and you couldn't see them with live scope or anything like I had to I literally had to find them with side scan so once I found those spots in practice and it's, it's areas that I had fished before and found, but when I realized how special it was, I tried to find as many of those areas as I could in that particular Creek. And, um, so that, that's really what I was targeting. And it was hardcover. Yes. It was a little bit of wood down there, but I mean, it, it literally, some of the time it looked like it was, it was like a, a four before post that a local had planted. And I, that was all literally all I was fishing, but it was right on that grass edge. So those fish could just come right out of the pads, right out of the grass and, and right on that post. And now you found this spot. It sounds like in the Shenandoah uh, division and okay, the tide's wrong. But it sounds like going into this event, you're like, okay, this is a spot that this should be on. Were you worried that, was there going to be enough fish where you can have a bunch of different spots you're going to run? Or was it just, I'm going to kind of stay in this generic area and just do rotations? So, yeah. So, so my first, my first run through the area, I actually started it off. The tide was still supposed to be, uh, outgoing when, when I got to the area, but for whatever reason, the tide was already coming in. So I stopped shy and and started working the wrong way with the tide and kind of drifting over all of my stuff. But I, I was there and I didn't want anybody to come in on me. So, and I didn't know how many boats was going to, was going to make the run and come that direction. So I said, well, I'll just go ahead and run it the wrong direction first and see what happens. And like my, I don't know, very early on my second or third cast, I, I catch a four pounder. So Dude, wow. I, rest of the area kind of like that. And I'm like, you know, I figured I'd catch a few more. And I did, I caught, I, I almost had my limit my first time going through. Um, or maybe I did have my, I can't remember. Uh, it all happened so fast, but it was only one good fish. You know, the rest of them were kind of small. So I get to the end of the area and I see some wood that's actually sticking up out of the pads. So when I see that wood sticking out of the pads, I figured I'd go over and throw the buzz bait around it. Well, I had gotten so shallow my trolling motor was in the mud and I couldn't go any further. And I just start like the only thing I can think of my primary, my primary bait was a drop shot, but obviously you don't throw the drop shot up in that, that nasty stuff. So I just, only thing I had on my boat deck was a drop shot and a buzz bait. So uh, I threw, I picked up the buzz bait through the buzz bait and probably my second or third cast with the buzz bait. I caught a good one and uh, put that one in the boat and it just lurked it down. I never heard it hit just lurked it down. I fan, I was fan casting around in that stuff and I ended up catching another good fish. So I had three of the right ones almost from the jump. And, uh, that's, that's kind of how, that's kind of how it started. And, uh, I actually, somebody started coming my direction and I gave up on the buzz bait fish. I don't know if that was the right or wrong choice, but I didn't want anybody else to, you know, get on that area and start coming down the wrong way. Like I did. Uh, I was kind of, trying to let it cool off before I went back through it. So when I was coming that direction, I turned around and started heading back. You hit on two key things that I think are important. Uh, uh, it's a fun like discussion is that people win both ways where it's, you can't trust the tide chart on any GPS unit on any map because mother nature is squirrely. And I enjoy staying in an area that you think is prime because if the tides 20 minutes earlier, 20 minutes late, you will still catch the juice versus if you try to just be too cutesy and time it. And the other part is being defensive. Um, if you find the area, I, I feel like on tide, it lends itself to camping versus if you are on cur, there's a thousand brush piles. You might not want to camp on just one, but if you find the juice on tide, that might be stuff where a defensive strategy does work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely believe that. It, you know, it's it's pretty crazy too. It, I I feel like I was just super dialed in for this for this tournament because that boat, one of those boats, ended up. It did come slip in on me. Um, they just they stopped shy, probably a hundred yards, and turned around and started working the tide the right direction. So, uh, 
you know, I, I was probably before it was all said and done, I was probably three cast links from the back end of their boat and they're working up through there and they're, they're fishing and it, they're using some moving baits. I couldn't tell you, it looked like a swimming Cinco maybe or something like that, but it was hard to tell. I was so far away, but they, they are working their way up through and not getting bit. And I'm like, I'm behind them just steadily getting, just steadily getting drilled on the drop shot. I mean, I, I was, I was catching fish and then I would, I would get way far behind them uh, while I was culling or whatever. And then, and then I would get right back up to, you know, get pretty close back up to them. And finally uh, I, I caught the one that was five and a half and I was, I don't know, I was probably 50 yards behind them when I caught that fish and uh, <laughs> you know, just following right behind somebody, something that I would typically never do, but, I was just so dialed I, and I knew that area had the fish. I just decided to do it. But when I caught that fish, uh, the guy just kind of waved at me. He picked his trolling motor up. <laughs> he was like, you know, it's obviously not my day. And he, he kind of rolled. So uh, that, that was, that was actually kind of crazy that, you know, again, I'm used to fishing Smith mountain and you would, you would never fish behind somebody like that. Just the confidence wouldn't be there. It is the, the tale of why I think some people struggle if you are a North Carolina Kerr angler, a, a, a Smith Mountain Lake angler, and then you go to the James of the Potomac because a lot of it is completely different. When you found this place at the last BFL, did you, to practice for this, do you, I mean, do you even practice or do you just catch one and be like, they're here and I'm done? So, for for the last BFL, I had an area that I leaned on for my morning for my morning bite, and that spot that I caught the fish this tournament to win, I went I was I was in there dead last. So I knew the fish were there. I left that area alone, but I really wanted to explore. I, I caught a pile of keepers in a in a in another creek that's actually further down uh, further down than the chick. So I had caught a pile of keepers there the week prior. So I go to that area and practice is the only area that I really fished in practice. And I tried to exploit that or, you know, see what was there. That creek was so small. I, I, I won't say I caught every fish out of that creek because I know I didn't. But that area was so small, I don't feel like there was many fish left. I, I, I went in there and I never got a bite. And I was fishing the juice. I, hooks uncovered, you know, and I just never got a bite in that area. So when that happened, I'm like, all right, I know I'm leaving this alone. I won't fish this at all for this particular tournament. And, uh, I, I, yeah, I pretty much knew where I was going to start and, and, and I left it alone in practice. The only thing I did is, is I did go towards that area and I side scanned some more stuff all around and, uh, actually tried to locate another Creek that was similar to that one. Um, and see if I couldn't find any more fish in that. And, and I did just not, just not the same quality. Fun question I like to ask title guys, and they're split on this. Did you turn your electronics off once you started fishing, or did you keep them on when you're fishing that shallow? Yeah, so I kept my live scope on, um, but I turned my – I always turn my side scan off when I'm fishing a tournament. Interesting. Like, yeah. I, yeah. All my other transducers go off, but I do – I always leave my live scope on. I've always been curious about that because we have a group of anglers that say – yeah, I think fish are getting spooked by forward-facing sonar, especially at Smith and Kerr. But then also, we're going to shine the cancer beam in a foot of water and lily pads. And it's like, so do they just not care versus the Smith Mountain Lake fish? That's just weird. Uh -oh. But anyway, um, when did you think you actually had a bag? Was it when, the, when you got the five-pounder? Yeah, when I, when I caught let's see i had 14 i had i had made a bunch of calls and i had caught like i was up to like 14 and a half pounds um when when i caught that five pounder it put me up to like 17 and i knew i knew then that i had a really good bag i didn't think i had a chance to win at 17 but you know i just i knew at that point i had i had a good bag and i you know the tide was the tide was getting wrong at that point so i knew that I was probably about done in that area and I, I, I knew I should honestly probably leave, but I did have a good bag. I knew the quality of fish that was in the area. So I did hang out a little while longer and was able to, uh, 
to make one more cull. And when I did, I, I, I really didn't even weigh that fish. I just knew it was bigger than the two and a half that I had. So I swapped it out for two and a half. And that's, uh, that's what ended up getting me to my 18, 14. What, what time in the day did you catch that fish? Uh, I was done. It was like 10, 10 30 or 10 40. Oh, wow. when, when I caught that, it was pretty early. Okay. So yeah, you weren't hard pressed then. So w when you get a bag like that at, at that early, did you decide just to camp out in the area, run some other stuff or just get back to the ramp early? Cause you felt like you have a good bag. Yeah, I, I started making my way back. Um, I had a couple of key areas that I wanted to hit on the way out of the chick. And I actually, I did uh, stop on a brush pile and I broke a uh, three and a half pounder off on a brush pile. And that, that one kind of hurt, but that is totally my fault. I, I, I waited entirely too long to set the hook and the fish actually jumped out of the water before I ever set the hook. He had hooked himself and jumped before, <laughs> before wow. I ever set the hook and he was he was tangled all up in the brush pile. So I, I really never stood a chance at him. Uh, and from that point, Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Continue. And I'll, I'll, I'll add it later. Yeah. From that point, I, I, I started just kind of hit, hitting my areas on the way out of the chick and, and going back. I knew the wind had started to blow. We were supposed to get a storm that evening. So I knew we were going to get some wind and I just planned on running fairly slow all the way back out. For some reason, the fish had started to, uh, you know, they started looking a little funky in the live well. I, I G juiced them and put some ice on them, and uh, they they did fine. But I, I knew I was going to not fly back to the ramp. I, I, I'd prefer not to take that penalty of dead fish. And, and I guess that's a, a qu you fish probably way more big tournaments than me. Do, when do you go back to the ramp early, especially when you have a long run where it's like, I have a good bag and God forbid I hit something or something happens. I need to get back. Would it be like 20 ish pounds? Like what would you be like? Yeah, I need to, I need to get back safe and sound. Yeah. If I'm fishing a tournament and it's a partnered tournament, I would, I would, I would get back to the ramp quick. But you know, when you're fishing a BFL and you got a co-angler in the back, you kind of feel uh -huh. like you owe him a full. So I, I didn't want to, I didn't just want to roll out. Obviously, uh, in my mind, I, 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 that 20 pound mark would have been would have been great. And that's kind of what I was looking for. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm not going back to the ramp early and, and giving up uh, with a co-angler in a boat. I think we we checked in with like three minutes to spare when it was time, you know, when it was finally time to check in. So I, I actually we went back towards the ramp and I went past Osborne and went and hit a couple of things up there to see if, uh, for whatever reason, I couldn't find a big one that direction because the tide, uh, quite honestly, the tide was better in the chip. I mean, sorry, the tide was better in the James, especially further up, um, for this tournament, the later in the day is, you know, as later as it got in the day, the better the bite was up, up above Osborne. Yeah. And that's something just to make sure people understand, like, yeah, I, I wouldn't do the, the, the Timmy Horton get a pizza, but, I, I've made long runs where I've hurt things on the boat, so I would have definitely fished around the ramp, so to speak, to make sure, because that I get paranoid about that stuff. I've broken shit on my boat up on the bay before. I've snapped a power pole where you make a big-ass run, and then you have to come back, and you just don't know what the hell's going to happen. Uh, I, I would be nervous about that, dude. I'd be real nervous, especially the fish. My God, that would even be worse if you get a dead fish or something. Like I didn't even think about that. That would be depressing as hell <laughs> yeah i mean I about that more than not making it back you know it's, it's killing you fish especially in rough water you mentioned to me that you're going up north uh now that you got this w is this for f fishing is this for family vacation what is it it's a it's a family deal yeah just uh i'm not i'm not exactly thrilled the way it's raining but you know yeah, we're we're headed up north and actually uh uh, my my wife has some family that lives directly on the St. Lawrence, so we're we're going up there. It's a it's a family deal, and I don't think I'll get much fishing in, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> What's next for you, tournament wise, this year? I mean, what do you have coming up? Actually, back at the James for a two day in September, so I'm pretty excited about that one. Um, we'll see what happens. You know, you, you never can tell. Uh, so that's that's next for a two day, and then after that, it's a curly day and then start starting up for two regionals how hard will Kerr? how tough will the fishing be at Kerr in the fall 
you know, early fall at Kerr, September, October, first few weekends of October. It's it's brutal. Uh, I honestly look for, and I probably shouldn't say too much, but I honestly look for the spots to play um, pretty heavily in, in these events. I think that the spots have gotten to be decent mm-hmm. sized. And if you can get in the right school of them, I, you know, I think you can catch 13, 14 pounds of spots a day. And, uh, I mean, maybe more than that, but, you know, I, I'd feel pretty confident saying 13, 14 pounds of spots a day and do, do very well. I had, uh, I had Will Nash on two days ago, actually for our Monday night live. And he talked about that where like the spots are getting bigger to where there should start playing more and more as the years go on. Um, cause if you guys don't know with, with Kerr, you still need that unicorn of a largemouth sometimes to have that four or five pound largemouth to solidify the bag. But as these spots get bigger and bigger, that's less as important. If you can catch an average of a three and a half pound spot, I, it, I don't know why they go there that time of year. I, I get it. It's a big lake, but there's so, why don't you go to Smith or why don't you go to the, the title Potomac? I feel like those places just fish better that time of year. I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't disagree. You know, I I kind of like tough events, so it doesn't bother me that bad. But I've been out in practice before, and I'm not hitting my juice, but I've been out in practice before at Kerr in September and never gotten a bite. And I can only imagine some of the guys coming from out of town that's like, man, this, this place is trash. Is there even any fish here? And it's like if you have your spots, you can go to them and catch fish. But if you don't have your spots – Hey, you're 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 liable to go out in zero at Kerr in September. You know, first few weekends of October before the before the bite really gets good, and there'll be a schooling bite. You know, but I mean, you got to get on it, and it's going to be a hundred plus other people trying to find it and get on it as well. That now you talk about boat draw, that's going to be pretty huge. Boat draw at Kerr for that one will be big. What is the funnest place that you go to fish? And it doesn't have to be a tournament because Kerr to me is not like a place that I'm super passionate about fishing a tournament, generally speaking. It's just not, eh. But Smith in like the spring, it's like, all right, that's going to be fun. Uh, you know, you hit the James and sometimes it's good. Smallmouth events I always love. Like, do you have a place that's like, I, I don't care if I win, but damn, it's fun going there? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's Smith. I'm, I'm, I'm 20 minutes away from Smith and uh, that's just, that's, that's kind of home to me. And I feel like I can go to Smith pretty much anytime and catch, catch fish. So I, I do like that. Uh, now, Kerr, it's a time of year that at Kerr, they, they get on a whopper plopper really good. And it can be a really fun place to fish. The James, I've, I've, I've had a tough time at the James. Um, it, years past, this year was obviously a good one. Um, but but I, I do like to fish at the James. I catch a lot of fish. And, you know, I, High Rock's not a bad lake. I, I just can't seem to ever like. I think I finished in the top ten with only four fish. They're they're just big there. They have huge fish at Kerr. I mean, I'm sorry at at High Rock. And I I just have a I have a tough time catching a limit there. Every time I go, it's it's just it's tough. But I have some really good spots. They hold really big fish. It's just to me the spots that I got the fish roam a lot, and then they pull up on the spot for a brief amount of time. And then they're back out chasing shad. But when they're on that spot, I can catch them. But they may only be on that spot a few times a day. It's interesting, the tale of those two lakes, because I feel like Kerr doesn't have enough fish for the size of the lake. And then High Rock is almost, it's like it only has like a couple of big ones. And that's it. Versus Kerr has a shit ton of little ones, but not enough big ones. There's not a balance. Those lakes are just off balance so bad compared to like a Smith where there's a good balance of of quantity and quality. Yeah, I think I think that has a lot to do with the stocking. And, you know, they 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 take care of Smith, not to say they don't take care of bugs. But I, I think Kerr is just so it's it's so spread out. It's it's such a big lake. You could probably you're right. You could probably dump. I don't know what they're putting in there yeah. every year for. They could triple it and it would be fine. Yeah, I I agree with that. And if they would ever, they'd never do this. But if they kept the water steady in the springtime, um, that would really help the spawning class there. And then maybe someday they'll put a a better marina at Gaston, and we could actually start going to Gaston to get a little pressure off of Kerr as well, because that and Roanoke Rapids are pumping out some waste. Roanoke Rapids, I know it's too small, but that place is actually popping right now, too. So, yeah. I don't know. 
they just need to they need to mix up some of these like and i get it if you have a 200 boat draw there's only so many places you can go but i mean like what the bpt did um going to a 30 boat field so you can go to smith I, I they need to create some kind of series that's maybe smaller but you can go to different places just so you can experiment with different watersheds uh because lake ann is too small probably for a bfl but a hundred boat field it could definitely handle something like that and they catch 25 pound bags certain times a year there but yeah interesting stuff there so you know with, with all that said the last thing i want to leave with you is mentally what changed for you this year on the james river compared to years prior was it just the spot you found or was there something else that clicked uh i think I, honestly, you know, years past, I, I always tried to fish in the James and the, I just, I don't know, I guess I kind of, I won't say I gave up on the James, but there, the, the, the quality of fish is definitely better in the chick. And I know everybody says they, you know, you replant the fish in the James, but those fish are just harder to catch once you replant them up there, you know, whether you decide to fish the, the jetties or, or the creeks or whatever you do. And obviously there's, there's big fish up there from that, but I, I like going where they, where they, where their home range is and where they like to bite kind of not where they have been transplanted to in their roamers or, uh, they're trying to find a new home. I'd rather go, you know, go to their house and catch them. That's kind of the way I, I looked at it. And it, you know, I learned before I never really made that run to the chick. I would stay, I would stay in the James. And, and once I started making a run to the chick and learning more about it, I'm like, okay, it is worth the hour long run to get there. Um, depending on where you go, you know, I guess you can be at the mouth of the chick in about 40 minutes, but <clears throat> you know, and, and honestly, I've, I've explored the chicken beyond, like I, I don't mind going past the chick now. Uh, I just know I know the the quality of fish are there to win tournaments and and I think you got to put yourself in the best in the best spots in the best in the best areas to catch the best quality of fish and for me it's in the chick um, that's that's just where where I landed on and it it worked out. Can a run be too far? Ever, because I have friends that are like, hell no. But Brandon Polinick, Brandon Polinick, like five or ten years ago, he was like driving three hours, fish for one, and haul back. To me, it's that's too much. Everything has to be perfect. Like, is there a run in your opinion where like the fishing might be good, but that does not leave me enough time? You know, I I, I would hate to run much much further. I mean, you know, and I probably an hour and a half would, would max it out on me and it, and it better be some damn good fishing when you get there after an hour and a half. I mean, you know, in practice, you, you better have caught them really well. And, and, you know, I, I talked to a guy one time and he was like, do you know, with your run, how many 20 pound bags are in between, you know, this spot and this spot, how many 20 pound bags you're passing on the way. And it, 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 I mean, I think about that all the time and it's so true. There's a lot of 20 pound bags in between Osborne and the Chickahominy. I mean, it just is. The question is, is, can you catch them? And, you know, how, how did the tides line up and, you know, whatever it may be. But it's a lot of 20 pound bags in between the two. And, you know, I guess it's up to each individual person how far they want to run to catch those. But uh, I will run an hour and a half. And, I, you know, I know I'll run to the chick for pretty much every tournament from this point forward that I fish. Um, even when the tide is better in the James, because I feel like the James gets overcrowded and can get overcrowded quickly and you're recycling water with everybody else. Is that the farthest <clears throat> run you've ever done or have you done some crazier ones in, in your career? I would have to say, I don't want to lie to you. Um, yeah, it, that's that, 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 like that hour, hour and fifteen minute range is the furthest. I know in practice a couple of times I've 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 went out until you see like sea boats out in the chick like in, in, in towards the James the uh, you know through past the James past the chick past all of that you you're getting real close to the Chesapeake Bay out there. I've 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 been out there looking for fish before. I had a friend who 
uh, went way the hell down on the Potomac River. I can't tell tell you where because I'll get in trouble with everybody. But he flipped into an area and set the hook, and he caught a stingray. And he turned to his friend like, "I think we went too far." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Oh my gosh, dude! I, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, is there anything we can promote? Any sponsorship plugs or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I I got a um, sponsorship through Cabela Short Pump. Um, I'm also on the White River National Team, so got to promote those guys. Um, you know, the the cool thing about these tournaments are, you, you know, everybody looks at, hey, this is the amount you win or whatever, but contingencies, man, they play a huge part. And uh, you got to thank all your contingencies. I mean, it's just – it's amazing that, uh, you know, you go win a tournament. Obviously, the tournament – I think I won 4300 bucks from the tournament. I win 8000 from Nitro. So – um, on top of that. So that's, that's a pretty good hit. And then, uh, Mercury protein got to thank those guys. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I'm not really looking for sponsors. I'm not, I'm not big on, on all of that. I'm, I, I'm kind of in a situation where I would like to go further, but I got a job that I've been at for 20 years. I got 10 more years and I can retire mm-hmm. and, I can, I can draw my pension after that time period. So I can't go anywhere, uh, for that 10 years. And, and really it's hard. I got five weeks of vacation, so it's really hard to fish a, you know, a professional type schedule for myself. And I, I really don't see that change. And I, I love the fish, but also, uh, you got to do what's best for your family. And, you know, you got to kind of got to play it smart and, and the further you move up, these, you know, most of these guys aren't playing games. They're, they're all in, you know, full time, mm-hmm. not, and, and they're able to fish a lot and the talent is crazy. It's really good. So I, I, you know, I'll probably just keep on doing what I'm doing and see what happens after these 10 years. If my body will hold up long enough to, to do it, I'll be 50 years old. So I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> You'll, you'll be 50 years young and with the medicine and stuff, you'll be fine. Um, yeah, it just keep doing what you're doing. And you brought up uh, an interesting point there with the BFLs is everyone thinks, I, I'm assuming some people don't know, you know, Phoenix is the title sponsor of the BFLs, but it's not just a Phoenix boat that does give you those rewards, which I don't know how many people know that it is an interesting fact. So very cool. Absolutely. All right, Chris, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Good luck with the rest of the year. And then as always, guys, you know, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. If you would like to, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps push it out there. Also, if you'd like to come become a Patreon member, we have a really cool meet and greet happening. It's happening Saturday, August 17th at 6 p.m. at Jake's Bait and Tackle for Patreon members only. Food and everything's provided for absolute free. And we'll be giving away some of our free merch and getting orders for some of our cool new designs that's coming out. Like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.